All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here for the third and final installment in the Basics of Botany webinar series hosted by the Arkansas Native Plant Society. We're very excited to have Dr. Richard ba Abbott back again this month as we continue to learn about the basics of botanical terms and terminology. Uh, again, I know I've uh, introduced him the past two times for those who might just be joining us on this third um, uh, part in the series. Dr. Abbott is an assistant professor of biology at the University of Arkansas, Monticello, uh, where he is also the curator of the university's herbarium. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and afterwards we will upload a recording to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at ANPS.org. Uh, joining uh, the Native Plant Society is pretty simple. You can just go to our website, ANPS.org slash join, uh, where you can use your PayPal account and uh, even join right now if you're not already a member. I'll also be placing the links uh, to the website and how to join in the chat, as well as links to our Facebook page uh, and YouTube channel. That way you can uh, find them there for future use. Let's see, just to make a couple announcements of things we have coming up. Um, uh, Saturday, June 25th, 9.30 a.m., the Ozark chapter of the Arkansas Native Plant Society is hosting a native plant hike at Osage Park in Bentonville. That is free and open to the public. Sunday, July 10th, the Eureka Springs Native Plant Collaborative is hosting a hike uh, at the Stephen Foster Glade, the newly dedicated Stephen Foster Glade Trail, uh, with Brittany Booth, who has studied uh, blade, uh, I mean, sorry, glade plant communities at the nearby uh, Devil's, Eyebrow, uh, Devil's Eyebrow Natural Area. She's also assisting with some of the glade uh, restoration work there at uh, Lake Leatherwood. So the glade, Stephen Foster Glade Trail is at Lake Leatherwood in Eureka Springs. Saturday, uh, July 16th at 6 p.m. will be the next webinar in this uh, in our yearly webinar uh, lineup that will be with Grace McCartha, who is a grad student at Arkansas State University. Uh, she's going to talk to us about her research on the plant communities of the lower Mississippi River Islands. And then after her will be Saturday, August 13th at 10 a.m., uh, uh, Katie Sims will be given a program on tracking the phenology of herbaceous species on Buck Island on the Mississippi River. So we'll have a couple of webinars coming up about the plant communities found on the islands uh, in the Mississippi River. Oh, some interesting, unique areas, I'm sure. But today with Dr. Abbott, we'll be learning about the basics behind plant names and nomenclature. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Abbott to... Uh, Take it away. Oh, and if you have any questions, feel free to unmute your mic uh, and ask Dr. Abbott. He's willing to take questions throughout his presentation, or uh, you can put them in the chat and I'll monitor that as well. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Eric. All right. So welcome, everyone. And so we've been talking about words the last couple of sessions, basically, you know, what, what words do we use to talk about you know, re vegetative plant features? What words do we use to talk about the reproductive plant features? And so, and so tonight's also about words, but in this case, what words do we use to talk about the plants themselves, the groups of plants themselves, and what's some of the stuff that goes into, into, into the names that we use? Um, and, and what it boils down to is, 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 is the information I've pulled together here tonight is generally kind of presented by me over a four, five, six lecture period. So we're, we're talking about four, five, six hours worth of, worth of information. And as always, there's just not enough time to fit all that in. So I'm going to kind of skim across the top, focus primarily on, on, on some examples of common, of common name types. Um, but I want to start off with kind of a little bit of an eclectic um, kind of, of, of overview. And I just wanted to, to back up for a second and just kind of show you that after this introduction, we are going to go ahead and talk about some of the general categories of names. But then the, the, there's some modules at the end that we're not going to have time for, but that I've put in here for, for your future reference. Um, and then so if, if, you, if you find yourself with any questions with something you want to follow up on, Please just just you know contact me. Let me know afterwards. Um, but again, if, if if we have time, I will I will address some of this. Um, but bottom line is is that, is that nomenclature and you know, the, what the information that we, that we find in plant names is a complex complex enough topic that I can't hope to do it complete justice in a sing, in a single hour here. Um, so be aware of that. Most of the slides that I, that I, that I'm that I'm previewing right here right now, we're simply not going to have time to talk about. But if you find something that piques your curiosity, please let me know. Um, and, and, and we, can, we can try to focus on those. 
Um, but, but for now, what I want to do is just kind of again, kind of set the stage, but just, just just set the stage by by again introducing this idea of the words themselves being you know what what we're focusing on here. And so something like a common dandelion. You know, we, most of us grew up you know, recognizing dandelions, learning about dandelions, um, and and so it's a, it's 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 one of these things where we just take that word for granted. But at the same time, anyone who's, who's had any kind of formal training in language knows that the word dandelion, the don de leon, literally means like the tooth of the lion, right? This comes from from something like French, you know, kind of these, these Romance languages, the roots that are there, the etymology, they're the same etymology, etymological root that we find, um, the don, uh, dent, you know, dentist, um, lion, leon, same, you know, same basic word here. Um, and so it, it turns out that, that, that a simple little name like this has a history that, that, that most of us are not going to be aware of. And the truth is that most of what's in a name is going to be stuff that most of us just simply aren't going to care about, these long convoluted histories. Um, the scientific name, I think most people, when, when, they, when they ask me about a talk like this, are actually wanting me to help, help people understand scientific names a little bit better. And so, for instance, the genus name of dandelion, Taraxicum. You know, someone might ask, well, what does this word mean? It turns out it actually comes from, from, from the Persian, and, and, and it's actually a, a word that means, in, in the Persian language, refers to a bitter purslane. Purslane being kind of like a potter, some sort of edible plant that people might grow you know, to, to have some sort of wintertime green, green, you know, green, something you just throw into the pot to add some substance to whatever stew you're cooking. Um, and so, so ultimately, how is this name Taraxicum linked to the, to, to, to the common name dandelion? It's a mistake. It was a historic mistake. There is a genus called Leontodon, which means the lion's tooth. But 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 you know, in the past, some botanists misapplied dandelion to taraxicum, and and so we've been living with this 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 mistake that was made for you know several hundred years ago. And this is kind of one of the interesting things for me about about asking about nomenclature or what's behind a name is is that it's about etymology, it's about history, it's about understanding the Latinized rules sometimes. Um, and, and then it's also about commemorating a, a, you know, past mistakes that got made uh, in, in, in way too many cases. Um, and then sometimes there's a little bit of like just human culture thrown in. So for instance, something like a tomato being a vegetable, you know, we could ask ourselves, what does tomato mean? What does vegetable mean? What do these words mean, right? You can get lost uh, down, down that rabbit hole if you want. But something as simple as just calling a tomato a vegetable is a, is a semantic argument, right? We all know botanically that since a tomato has, has seeds in it, it's got to be a fruit. But turns out that part of why, not, that's not the entirety, but part of why a tomato is, is thought of as a vegetable is, 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 is it actually goes back um, historically in our country, there were no laws, there were no tax laws for, for taxing the import of, of, of fruits. And so when farmers were complaining and upset that vegetables, that, you know, the, that the vegetable tax laws weren't being applied to the tomato crop, the, the lawmakers eventually ended up just kind of legally classifying tomatoes as a vegetable so that they could be taxed. And so that's a bizarre reason to be calling a tomato a vegetable, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a legalistic reason, but it has nothing to do with biology. And I wanted to use that as an example to make the point that, that nomenclature itself also has nothing to do with biology, has nothing to do with the living organism. Nomenclature is, is, is legalized semantics. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's about this kind of codified system of rules that we use for the names. It has nothing to do with taxa, with, with, with biology, with the organisms themselves. Um, so there's a lot more that can be talked about, but I'm going to move on because there's just not enough time to talk about everything here. Um, so I apologize for the delay here. There's, uh, anytime people add it, y'all don't see my screen, but anytime people join late, it, it actually throws a bunch of about 10 or 15 little menus get thrown across my um, across my screen. Like I, I end up not being able to see my screen because of all the little signs. And okay, I've got a clear screen again now. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to uh, uh, add people as I see them. That way they get it off your screen. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, it makes the menus pop back up across the screen. It makes like four or five little menus pop up across my screen and blocks everything. So, so, but it, it, it's all, it is what it is. Um, I was just was having trouble with them this, this evening with it. And so, again, most people, when they think about plant names, they think about nomenclature itself here. I just want to stress again that, that, that when we say nomenclature, we're talking about a naming system, right? These are human rules. This is just legalistic semantics. If you like arguing with people, if you like, if you like, if you're one of those game players who who loves the rules, who likes siding, well, according to Rule 13-2, sub point B, if, if you like those kinds of arguments, then you would love nomenclature, right? Personally, I don't like that kind of stuff. Um, and but I, and I do want to point out again here that nomenclature, even though, even the we as biologists use nomenclature, that there's no direct tie to biology, right? It's fun, It's fundamentally separate. It's, it's just codified law. Um, and so if if you want to read about 
nomenclature, if you'd like to better understand nomenclature, the, the current um, international code for, of, for nomenclature, of nomenclature for, 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 for botany, um, is, is, is at this, 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 this website at this link here. And there's a PDF link there that you can actually download and read for yourself here. And so basically it, it, it turns out that yes, we have a codified system of laws which regulate the, 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 the use and application of names. Um, personally, I find this really kind of boring and confusing most of the time. It's just not something that, that excites me. Um, but the names themselves also can have the etymological meaning, not besides the kind of legalistic definition of a name, um, there can be the etymological meaning behind it. And that can be kind of fun. If you, if you like languages, if, you know, if, if you're at all intrigued by the words that you use and where they came from, and the etymology can be fun. And for me, my favorite part of, of, of what's, what's in a name is the kind of the applied reality of it, right? These names can have meaning, they can be useful, they can be about recognizing patterns. And we've talked about that in the past. And that's gonna be a, a small amount of what we talked about here this evening as well. Just, I'll just touch on that again briefly. And so what we've already covered again is, is, is the basic plant ID features, the, 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 the names that we use for plant parts, right? The, you know, by, by name, you know, names are just words. And the words that we use for, for, for vegetative and reproductive um, uh, plant parts are, are the basis of, 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 of the patterns that we can talk about, right? And so, so you can focus on, we focus on the first time the vegetative features and we introduce things like the squash family, the passion flower family, the grape family. And something as simple as a tendril and, and, and being, having a tendril present to the node, this is a pattern, right? And so we had a name for that. And so sometimes names are artificial. I, so for instance, I made up this motif called tan, tendril to node, which is just an artificial name. So be aware of that. Names are kind of arbitrary. They're, they have no official um, set meaning. They're often just some, some arbitrary convention that we've come up with, but, that, but that's just part of reality, right? So we make peace with that and we, and we move on. Um, we can also use the reproductive features to come up with names, to talk about groups, to, to define the groups. And so, and so we talked about that last time, uh, the, the last time. And so this idea though, is, is that what we're doing here now is that these names then allow for kind of communication across time, across space, across cultures, across languages, right? And so in Arkansas, we might, you know, we might, we might care about the fact that there are you know, eight genera of, of, of squashes, 10 species. There's five genera of grapes with 14 species. There's only one genus of passion flower with just two species, but there's a context, right? You can look at the North American context for those same families. You can look at the global context for those families. And the thing is, is that, is that when we're talking about the formalized scientific names like Cucurbitaceae, Vitaceae, Passiflorace, those names transcend culture and transcend languages. All languages use the exact same names. And so that's the primary value to, to, to botanical nomenclature, to botanical names is, is, is that they transcend all the differences between all the people across the planet, right? It doesn't matter what language you grew up speaking, what language you go to school and study, if you're going to study biology and, and use the, the, the correct names, um, they, they've all been Latinized. And so that, that's, that's, that's the primary reason why I can say that the botanical Latin is worth learning because it will allow you to, to essentially pass on your ideas and communicate with people across time, space, and cultures. Um, so in this case here, knowing these motifs and understanding their patterns and then how they apply, not just to Arkansas, but to North America and to the world is for me part of what hides behind those names, right? So in, in order to talk about, in order to talk about these, 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 these you know, plants in general here, not only do we need to know that vegetative and reproductive vocabulary, um, if you want to then go ahead and add the extra layer of understanding the names themselves, it's about history, etymology, it tells us about the relationships, the phylogeny, right? And then we have these nomenclatural rules, these set of rules that we've made up here, right? And the names themselves, um, if, if you're talking about biological groups, should reflect natural, natural um, patterns, right? Um, we can, of course, use artificial motifs as well if the goal is just practical identification. Um, and so this, this is what names are for, right? So, so we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what do we want with names? Why do you need the names in the first place, right? Um, and so I'm not gonna read these kinds of slides. These are just here for you all to read on your own and they can follow up if you have questions basically. But the idea is, is that when we start thinking about this in the big picture pattern here, um, there's so many patterns, so many names, so many groups out there and that it can be overwhelming, right? It can be incredibly overwhelming. And, that, and that's, that's why I've kind of created those motifs and talk about the motifs is, is to help simplify it. But ultimately, if you wanna know what all the names mean, <laughs> There's no simplification to that other than understanding the, the, the root words themselves. So that when two words might share the same root, you know, you really just have to learn the root and then you might know two or more names. Um, but ultimately, if, if you want to understand all the names that you're using, you're just gonna have to learn each of the names on, on an individual basis 
Um, and then just keep in mind that when we apply these names, they're, they're not just kind of rotely memorized words, but they have meaning because the people that created these names understood the Latinized rules that were used to create the botanical, uh, botanical nomenclature names. And so this big picture phylogeny, this big picture relationships of things like orders. So, so I, I just kind of quick, quick review here is you know, we, we know that species um, that are related to each other are classified into a genus. And then, the, and then the, the plural of genus is genera, right? So, so if you have genera, they're related, they're classified into a family. Related families are classified as an order. And so there's this taxonomic hierarchy, right? So what we're looking at here are some of these orders here, like the Fabiales. This is the order that concludes the legumes and the milkworts. The Rosales, it contains things like, like the elms um, and, and, and the rose family and the buckthorns. The Curvitales is the squash order, right? And so, so, so if, if you want to try to understand what these big picture names mean, these ordinal names, um, there, there, there's, there's a, this, this beautiful poster out there that talks about that. There's some websites that talk about this. Um, and so, so you, can, you can try to understand names at higher levels as well in terms of their applied morphology. Um, but that's, again, that's, that's a separate talk, not something we're going to, going, going to go into great detail uh, with here this evening. Um, so, so kind of wrapping up the intro here so that we, we can move on with the, with the kind of the fun part and, uh, is, is when we think about kind of how many species, so now we're talking about plant species. This is a listing kind of, 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 of the groups of plants here. And in a county, I'm, I'm currently in Drew County. I don't know, you know where all y'all are, but your county probably has around a thousand species. Um, a typical state like Arkansas typically generally has you know, 2,000 to 2,500 native species and another 500 to 1,000 introduced species, right? So most states have somewhere around 3,000 species. Obviously, a few of the larger states can, 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 can be you know, substantially more than that. But, but on average, most states, about 3,000 species. Um, and all of North America, 20,000 species, right? And so in, in, in context, just, just be aware that the, the, that the world is, 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 not, you know, is not homogenous. It's, it's quite heterogeneous out there in, in terms of you know, the diversity that you find, the number of species you find per area. So a little country like Colombia, which is, which is you know, a, you know, a ninth the size of the US, basically, it's the size of two or three states, roughly, um, like Ohio and Illinois or something like that, um, actually has 4,000 more species than all of North America. What sits down on you know it sits down on the near near close to the equator. It's, it's got tremendous diversity. It's where northern flora meets southern flora. Um, there's coastal stuff, montane stuff. Just it's, it's it's the most diverse country on earth in terms of in, in, per area, right? Um, and and all of South America has you know what five six times more species than all of North America, right? So species are not evenly distributed across the planet. If you're trying to learn the species, you're trying to learn the names. Um, Got to kind of sort of have to ask yourself, okay, why? What do you want to know the name for? And 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 how many names do you actually want to try to learn here? Because globally, there's up to three hundred thousand, you know, maybe maybe be, be as many as four hundred thousand species of plants, right? And it's if you're like, okay, there's too many species, I'll just learn the genera. Well, there's still sixteen thousand species of plant genera, right? The plant families, you know, two hundred plus plant families, are are knowable, are learnable, right? Especially because the average state here in the U.S. only has about 150, 160, 170 families. Somewhere in there, and in Arkansas, we have right around 160 families of plants. So, so in terms of the diversity, in terms of the complexity, if you're trying to learn names, if you're wanting to apply names, um, there's just so much to learn, right? And, and and so you can just basically start trying to learn each name, and and, and then how to apply it. Um, oops, let me get some of these controls out of the way here, so I can see my screen again. Um, and so we talked about this idea of motifs to help simplify this idea that the diversity is just so tremendous that it's kind of difficult to work through, right? Um, so, so this is why I talked in the past about, about the idea of learning larger groups, understanding what monocots and dicots and angiosperms are, and, and talking about some of the easy orders like the gentianales, the, you know, the, the, that it's the order that contains the milkweeds um, and the gentians and the coffee family, right? The lamiales is the mint order. Um, Sapindales includes, includes things like citrus and, 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 and mahogany. Um, and then we've got these large families like the daisy family, the asteraceae, the mustard family, the brassicaceae, right? The caraflase or the chickweed family. Right? And so if, 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 you, if you're trying to be, if, you, if you're simply wanting to try, to try to learn the names for Arkansas and how to apply them and how to, and how to walk up to the most you know, number of species and put names on them, um, I strongly recommend that you learn these larger groups, these orders, these large families, or even just the largest genera, right? Carex alone has what, somewhere around 200 species. I forgive, it's a little, a little under, a little over, 160 species, something like that. Um, Carex is a very large genus, um, one of the largest genera in the world. But in Arkansas, we've got over, over 150, 160 species of Carex, right? 
Hypericum, you know, they're the St. John's Worts, the Quercus, the Oaks. These are all large genera. And just by learning these, what, five genera here, you're easily going to have, you know, what, what three, four hundred species at your fingertips, you know, 300 species or so. I'm not sure the exact number is there, but, you know, maybe 250, somewhere in there. Um, but ultimately, that's the idea, right, is, is, is try to focus on the big patterns if your goal is to use the names for identification purposes. And so, so kind of that, that was that was kind of the, 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 the end of the intro there, other than just kind of re, re, reiterating that what's in the name? Everything, right? Absolutely everything. These names are going to reflect history, your science, opinion, this kind of legacy of change over time. Um, and and so, so they tell us something. They, 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 they allow us to communicate. They allow us to retrieve information, right? And so, so, so words like Patagonia that you've all heard of, you don't have to know etymologically what that word means. You don't have to know what Argentina means. Personally, I like etymology. I like knowing what these words are, where they came from. And so pata is, is, is Spanish for like a foot, like a paw. And so in, in, in the Spanish language, if you want to make something bigger, you add that gon to the end of it. So patagon means like the big paw, the big foot. So Patagonia is a word that literally means like the land of the big feet. Um, and, and, it, and it was named that. So Patagonia, of course, is a region in, in, in southern South America, right? Well, the Spanish explorers who were there saw these giant footprints. Well, they didn't know about snowshoes. It turns out that the indigenous people who lived there wore snowshoes. And so the Spanish explorers saw these giant footprints and called the land Patagonia, again, the land of the big feet. And Argentina refers to silver, America. If you know, if you know, most of you, I'm sure, know history well enough to know that, 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 that Christopher Columbus had a friend, a cartographer, a map maker, who was named Amerigo Vespucci, right? Um, New York implies what? It implies there was an old York. <laughs> Um, we've been dealing with, you know, the, the, the coronavirus these last few years. Well, coronation just means crown, right? Coronavirus is named because its shape resembles that of a crown, right? Um, some of that Turtus migratorius here is, is the scientific name of, 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 the, of the robin here, the red-breasted robin. Um, and it might seem like someone, they didn't like this bird when they named it, right? Um, the migratory turd. Well, it turns out that in Old English, turd was actually just a name for a small brown bird. So turd meant small brown bird, and, and, and it, was, it was basically... You know, that word for small brown bird was then adapted for the for, for, for modern usage, right? Um, so and knowing something about history and etymology can be useful, but is but is is often not really necessary unless you're just trying to cram a bunch of information in your head, right? Um, but I want to I want to talk about three or four more examples quickly here. Um, but before I do that, I was going to stop and ask if there were any questions at this point in time. No. Okay. Move on then. So, so these first three or four examples these, that I want that I want to talk about here is this idea of what's behind a name. And a name like Quercus alba, right, is the name for, for the white oak. So the, the common widespread white oak that we have uh, across Eastern North America um, is Quercus alba Linnaeus. And so, so a botanical name has three parts. Right? It's got the genus, the specific epithet, and that makes up the species name. So a species name is two-parted, right? It's, 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 we've got binomial nomenclature, a two-parted name here. Um, and then, and then the L period is, is, is an abbreviation for Linnaeus, and, and, and so Linnaeus was was of course a, you know the, um, the person who you know, back in the 1700s kind of gets credit for coming up with our modern naming system. Um, and notice that, the, that there's another name, Quercus Abedin. There was a botanist later who, who basically tried to use that exact same name, and so it became an illegitimate later homonym. So we have to be aware of this that even when we're talking about scientific names. Um, if we accept that there's you know, roughly 300,000 species of plants that have been named and accepted right now, um, we have 1.2 million botanical names out there, right? So for every name that's accepted, there's, there's, there's on average about three names that have been rejected for whatever reasons, right? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of legalistic reasons why those names are rejected, but be aware of that, that you'll sometimes find confusion in the literature because two or more people might have misused a single scientific name and we have rules that regulate that. And that sometimes the names change because people have violated the rules or someone has, has discovered something that, 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 that modern people had forgotten, right? And I wanted to just briefly talk about this idea of, of common names as well, because a lot of people are like, oh, common names are so much easier and simpler. Um, but I just want to stop and ask for a second. OK, so fine, white oak sounds simple, right? But what do we mean by white, right? It turns out that there's, there's lots of shades of white. In fact, the book on botanical Latin has over 20 different words that mean white. You know, are you talking snowy white or pearly white or creamy white or yellowish white or they're just all different colors of white that historically people had words for. And then keep in mind that oak, well, we all kind of know what an oak is, right? We think about these lobed clustered leaves and that's, that's for me is the motif, right? Most of our oaks have lobed leaves, lobed leaves that are clustered towards the tips of the twigs. Our oaks also have acorns on them, right? These nuts. 
that have those the, 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 that, that cap, which is actually a cluster of modified leaves, is these bracts. So you have an endolucrate cap at the base of a, a relatively large nut, which characterizes the oak genus. But it turns out that in other countries, and even in the US and other parts of the US, oak is also used for a lot of other words. Oak is a word that goes back thousands of years to the beginning of the Indo-European languages here. And it was kind of more or less synonymous with tree for a while. And so there's lots and lots of different cultures around the world that use the word oak to mean different types of trees. And so there's, there's not a lot of clarity there basically, right? It's just that we have this, this, this kind of shared understanding of what we mean by white oak. But even then it turns out that there's a single species of white oak that we, that we call Quercus alba, but there's actually several dozen species that are white oaks. White oak is also the common name for a subgenus of oaks. They're characterized by, by, by not having bristle tips at the tips of their lobes. The red oaks have bristle tips at the, at the tips of their lobes. And so ultimately this, this idea of, we think we like common names, we think they're easier, <laughs> but if you actually start scratching the surface, even, even common names um, are, are fraught with the exact same kinds of problems that we sometimes have with scientific names. But I'll back up for a second here because in human society, our ancestors knew the difference between white oaks and red oaks for, for, for some very simple reasons. Um, the, the white oaks have, have acorns that mature in a single year and, and, and they're not as bitter, they're, they're not as full of tannins. The red oak acorns tend to be a lot more bitter and so, so if you were going, going to, to, to be eating acorns, you would probably would have harvested the white oaks rather than the reds because they taste better without, without being processed. If you were a cooper, someone who made barrels, white oak, uh, the, 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 the wood anatomy of a white oak makes, makes better barrels basically. And so coopers would, would, would preferentially use the white oak over the red oak also because the red oak would impart more of a flavor. So there are some people who will use the red oaks if they're wanting to add that distinctive flavor of the red oak to whatever it is that they're storing. Um, so historically, people knew and cared about white oaks, uh, e even if modern society has kind of forgotten why. Um, other, other words, uh, just a, a kind of brief example, introductory example of, of some etymological fun here. Um, words like lycopodium, which is, which is a, one of the fern allies, right? There's, there's, there's a lycopodiums are called club mosses or ground cedar. Um, lyco refers to, a, refers to a wolf and pod refers to, 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 to a foot. So if you think about a, like a, a, a pedestrian or a podiatrist, these kinds of things, that, that ped pod root means, means foot. Well, somebody back in the day thought that this, that this club moss down here in the lower left corner looked like a wolf's paw. Okay, well, keep in mind, this is pre-modern TV, pre-modern you know, imagery. You know, pe pe people, people might have you know, agreed to, 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 that, to that shared delusion of, of calling that a wolf's paw, um, even without the actual kind of imagery um, th th that we just take for granted these days here. But why I'm mentioning this at all here is, 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 is that root, that, that root lyco itself. Um, so so that, that, that root lyco, again, refers to wolf here. So, so if we look at something like lycopersicon, that was the old scientific name, the old genus name for the tomato. It literally meant wolf peach, right? Persia means peach. Persia was, a, peaches actually came to us from Persia, right? And so we, we, call, we call the region of Persia, Persia, because it's where peaches came from. Um, and, so, and so peaches are prunus persica because they came from Persia. But like a persicon, the wolf peach. Um, this, this, this puffball fungus here above, lycoperidon, was <laughs> kind of one, of one of my most fun names to play with. Um, lyco, once again, wolf. Peridon is referring to a fart, right? So, so the name of the name of the puffball literally means wolf fart, right? And so these words had meaning, and, and I just want to stress that again: is, is that historically the people who, who 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 named our plants and animals actually had an understanding of the Greek and Latin. They were all classically lettered in Greek and Latin. And, the, and, the, and, they, and they, they used words that had meaning that, that had been preserved from two or 3,000 years earlier, right? And so other languages like, like, like the, the, the example down here of, of, of in German here of, of, of the light bulb here, blue beer, and it literally means the glow pair, right? And that's, that's such a fun name, right? Calling a light bulb a glow pair is just so fitting, right? But I'm mentioning this one because I wanna stress the idea that, 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 that most languages actually have genders more so than we do in English. And so, the, so light bulbs are female in, 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 in German. And the table, der Tisch, is the, the table is masculine. And thus messer, which is a knife, you know, is, 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 is neutral. And so it turns out that the rules um, that, that we use for, 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 for botanical nomenclature are, are, come from Latin. And Latin was one of the languages that actually uh, used, used gender. And so a lot, of, a lot of what goes on with our names is actually tied to the gender. Um, but again, we don't need to worry about that kind of stuff uh, at, at this time. But it's one of those things you have to keep in mind 
is, is that Latin was a, is, 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 has, has a lot of formal rules tied to gender and tied to the various cases like nominative, accusative, dative, you know, things like you know, the, the direct, direct objects and indirect objects and you know, the, things like that, that we just don't generally think about. But they're, but, but they're an important part of the names um, that, that were used historically. And so the etymology itself um, is not going to fully illuminate meaning, right? So, so the names are actually a reflection of, 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 of the nomenclature, the rules that we have. They also can reflect the taxonomy, which is kind of the naming of taxa, the study of groups and species. Um, systematics is kind of this, this, the study of, of classification. It's, it, it's studying the groups without necessarily knowing the species involved. Um, and then phylogeny is kind of studying the, the, the relationships, right? It's the evolutionary history of a group or studying the relationship. And so names will tell us about all of these things here, right? And so ultimately the truth is, as I already mentioned, if I were really going to do justice to, 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 to what's behind a name, we would have to spend an hour or so on each of these topics here, which, which we're not gonna do here. Um, and so one last example before I jump into the kind of the, 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 the fun, the fun uh, major bulk of what I wanna do here this evening, was something like dogwoods. You know, we're all familiar with dogwoods, no clue why it's called dogwood, right? I mean, you can look up and find you know, historically why people called it dogwood, um, but it's not gonna mean anything to most of us. It's just not a story that we're familiar with. Um, Cornus, if you know the name Cornus, once again, well, what does Cornus mean? What, what is the etymology of Cornus? Do, we, do, we, do you wanna know that? Are you wanting to know history? Are you wanting to know etymology? What are you wanting to know, right? For most of us, we're just wanting to walk up to something and put a name on it. And once we can take something and kind of characterize it or categorize it, it allows us to dismiss it, right? Same reason we use stereotypes, right? To be able to, 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 to dismiss things, to handle things, right? But names change. And so if, if you're at all familiar with, 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 with this mess of, of, of how a name might go through two, three, five, ten changes in, 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 in one lifetime, um, it turns out that Cornus has, has, been, has been rearranged. Um, oops. That Cornus has been rearranged. And people are, 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 some people are now trying to suggest that we recognize four different genera of dogwoods. Personally, I'm not a fan of that. I don't like it at all. I don't see the need for it at all. But each of these four groups do actually represent morphological patterns, phylogenetic patterns, distributional patterns, biogeographic patterns, the, you know, the physiological evidence, um, the patterns of hybridization. There's a lot of evidence that there, that there are basically four different groups of dogwoods. Do we want to keep calling them all cornice or not? And so I just use this as, as, as an example uh, to, to, to illustrate the kind of the complexity of nomenclature. And so, so if, if you ever want to have a separate talk about uh, it's kind of like a more hardcore look at some of the names that have changed and why, and um, we can schedule that. But, but just be aware that, there, that, that when you see names changing all the time, it's, it's sometimes because we've learned something new, we've learned more about it. In the case of dogwoods here, we've, we, we, we have finally come to understand what, what, what the patterns are within the genus that we call dogwood. And some people want to then go ahead and recognize four separate lineages, even though it's not really necessary. It's just one of those things that, that, that a few people are trying to promote. And so when I said it's not really necessary, this is because of this idea that rank is arbitrary. So, so when we define a family or a genus, the typical non-scientist thinks the scientists have some sort of rules that we follow for this. And the truth is we don't. Rank is, is, is arbitrary. A genus is whatever the taxonomist tells us it is. A family is whatever the taxonomist tells it is. There are no set um, definitions for families or genera. Um, so there's no authoritative definition for a group, right? Um, there's no single answer here. There's no single authority to appeal to, right? You're going to have different taxonomists arguing about names. And they're going to change once again when we realize that someone in the past made a mistake or that our understanding of the group has changed, right? And so, 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 so keep in mind that these changes can sometimes take decades to, to, to make it in a mainstream culture. And often about the time a name change finally, finally gets accepted, it changes again. <laughs> and so it's kind of frustrating. Um, so again, it just kind of illustrates once again, the question is, is why do you want to know names? How much do you want to scratch and delve into this? How, how, much, how, much, how much do you want to learn basically? How much time do you want to spend trying to learn all, all the details behind these kinds of things, right? So I'm going to just jump here, jump here now to, the, to this next part here, because um, what I want to do with for the next 20, 25 minutes or so um, is, is go ahead and talk about the general categories of names. So it turns out, setting aside all the stuff that I just talked about, and again, if you have any specific questions, I'm happy to entertain them. There's also modules at the end that you can follow up and ask me questions about. But what I want to do now, though, is kind of run through kind of like these kind of six major patterns, these six major categories of, of, of names that we use here. Um, so I'll just stop for a second and ask again if there are any questions that anybody wants me to address at this time? Nope, okay. All right, so let's move on then. 
So it turns out that, 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 that most of the names that we use, we use them because our ancestors used them, is, 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 is to, put it, to put it bluntly. Um, we use them because our ancestors got words from their ancestors, who got words from their ancestors, and all the way back, right? And so, so, so linguists, people who study languages, can look at words like piper. This, this is the source of black pepper for us, right? It actually goes all the way back to a Sanskrit word, right? which is kind of like one of these kind of very primitive languages that, 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 that's very near the base of the Indo-European languages. Um, and so, so, so you, know, you know, you can read the details yourself. I don't want to get bogged down trying to, to, to talk about all the details here, um, but I just wanted to stress the idea of, 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 of words change over time, right? We know that words and word usage change over time. So this word piper, you know, the same, it has the same etymology as pepper here, um, has nothing to do etymologically with the idea of a musical piper. Um, and then the idea of pepper in terms of like the, the, the hot peppers, the chili peppers from the new world, um, that came along you know, 2000 years later, right? There were no hot peppers um, in the old world. Um, and the hot peppers, the chili peppers are indigenous to the new world. Um, and so the, 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 the word pepper that was being used for, for, for black pepper from, from the old world um, was, was, was applied and, and, and it actually then meant this idea of kind of spirit or energy. And so if you think about this idea of it being pep, like if you went to a pep rally when you're in school, that actually ties back to the idea of that hot, spicy, heat, energy, spirituality, what, you know, what, however you want to see it there. So it's, again, this idea that words change and, and, and people who study linguistics like this, it, it can be fascinating reading, reading this, this change over time, right? Um, kind of a couple of fun ones here. We have a passion flower down here in the lower, in, in the lower right. Um, it's called Passiflora, Passiflora Shiksuits. And that word Shiksuits might seem very intimidating, yeah, trying to spell that. But I said, spell chic suits, right? <laughs> Who's going to spell it that way? But it turns out that the, the, the man who described this species um, was, was, was studying in Central America and adjacent Mexico and um, Belize area. Um, and, and there was a Mayan word that meant bat wing, right? And so this thing had, had, had leaves that were shaped like a bat wing. And so he borrowed the word from Mayan for a bat wing, right? Another one here, this, this Hidnora Sinandevu. Um, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is something we're going to go ahead and show the next picture here. Um, Hidnora is, 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 is a genus that, gr that grows below the ground. It's, it comes from the Greek for truffles, which kind of grow below the ground here. So there's this, this really cool genus of, 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 of plants that grow in the deserts in Africa. Um, and they usually have hairy, hairy flowers. And the inside of the flowers are typically, typically very hairy. But someone discovered a species that, that, that didn't have hairs. And if you want to work in that part of Africa, you learn Swahili because that's what people speak there. And so who, the, the man who described this described it as Hidnora Sinandevu. So we might hear that word Sinandevu and think, well, that's a word I don't, I don't know how to spell that word. I have no clue what that word means, right? Well, you got to speak Swahili to find out that it means I don't have a beard. <laughs> and so part of why I'm showing this one, though, is just because it fascinated me. When I was a kid, this movie Tremors came out, right? Some of you may have seen this movie, kind of a silly, cheesy movie, but these giant worms pop up out of the ground and, 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 and eat people, basically. And, and I'm pretty sure that, that, that these giant worms were modeled after Hidnora. They just, they just, the, 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 those worms and, and, and tremors look just like Hidnora's popping out of the ground. Um, so I always found that fascinating at how a mainstream culture kind of integrates biology, botany and biology sometimes, right? The movie Predator with these mouths that move sideways. If you've never looked closely at a grasshopper mouth, that's what these predator mouths are. That's, that, that's a grasshopper mouth. Yes, there's some minor differences there, but or major differences depending on your take on it. Um, but anyway, a lot, a lot of this stuff that we, that, that, that we integrate into, into, into modern culture has meanings from other cultures, has meanings in the biological world that we're just simply unaware of, right? Because it goes back, way back in history. The second major category of plant names is, are, are, are the words his, that historically mean something about and, and, and tell us something about the plant, right? So for instance, you see the word thamnus here? This, 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 this is the Greek word that means shrub. Lobata means lobed, and sisa means like cut or dissected. Serrata means two, the load, punctata means punctate. So the plant parts for leaves, flowers, fruits, seeds, um, various sizes or shapes, the colors, right? All of these words have, 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 have meaning in, in Greek or Latin. And, and again, the people over the last 300 years who have been describing names have, have, until very recently, have always been classically lettered in Greek and Latin. So they knew what these words meant when they used them. Um, and so an example here, passiflora, which is a, a type of passion flower, um, and how do you even say this word, right? Um, you look at all these E's and U's and I, the passiflora. And, and then if you know that the, 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 the eudipabulum is actually being, being I don't know, phrase, is, is describing, it's telling something about the plant, right? There, there's this, mod, there, there, there's this, 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 this butterfly genus, um, it's called euides, um, which eats this plant. And pabulum is a word that refers to fodder or food, like animal food. 
And so you really pad them just means this is the passion flower. This, this is the passion flower that is eaten by this species, right? And so again, that's a, that's a very obscure, hard, cryptic word, but it actually has meaning for people who, who, who know something about, about butterflies and, and, and Latin and Greek roots. Another fun one from Africa, um, Euphorbia calisana. Again, calisana, what does that mean? Well, it turns out it's Swahili for very fierce or dangerous, right? Um, so if you look at this plant, sure enough, it lives up to its name, right? This, this is a type of spurge related to poinsettias. A, a third major category of names is, is that they're geographic, right? They tell us something about the part of the world that, 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 the, that the plant or animal came from, right? So we might not know what those parts of the world are, like Sundayaka, well, where's the Sunda region? Well, the Sunda Isles are over there near, you know, near Bali in Indonesia, that, that part of the world, right? Byz Byzantica, well, who the hell knows anything about the Byzantine Empire, right? Well, some people refer to it as kind of a, you know, somehow tied to the Roman Empire. Other people are like, no, no, very, you're very different. It has nothing to do with the Roman Empire. Um, bottom line is there was, there was a part of the world called Byzantium, right? And so plants from this part of the world in the lower right corner over here, plants that are collected in, in, in this area, um, are often are often called uh, or labeled with with with, with the moniker of Byzantica, saying that they came from that part of the world. Um, Nova Granatensis, Nueva Granada in Spanish. What, what does this mean? It means New Grenada, right? Where was New Grenada? Well, the, the picture to the left here shows you. New Grenada was you know, a big chunk of Central America. It was Colombia, Ecuador, down into parts of Peru and, and, and modern um, Brazil. Um, and so, uh, so Nueva Granada, New Granada, was that part of the world. So plants that have the name Nova Granatensis on them came from that part of the world. Right? And so we understand other things like this. Ludovisiana, close to home, means Louisiana, right? So if you see, if you see something like Philippus, Ludovisiana, that's telling you that, it's, that, that it was originally discovered in Louisiana and described from there. Plus there's words like Borealis, which means Northern, Australis means Southern, things like that, right? Platinus occidentalis, our, you know, our sycamore tree. Um, occidentalis just means Western. And that's kind of a confusing thing. How, why does the Western sycamore grow in Eastern North America? Because the people who described it were in Europe and to them, <laughs> North America was West of them. So that's why it was called occidentalis, right? So at some point in time, we, we, we find ourselves saying, okay, you know, we, we wanna use these names, they're understandable, but at the same time, it gets kind of confusing, like Greenlandica. There are plants that grow in the, in, in the Rockies that are labeled as, as Greenlandica, as, as if they were from Greenland. And it turns out that, that the specimens got misfiled. And so when Linnaeus was studying them and describing the species, he thought they were from Greenland. He made a mistake basis, somebody made a mistake. And so we're stuck with plants that are only found in the continental US in the Rockies being called Greenland because historically two, two 300 years ago, people thought they had come from Greenland. Um, and so in Arkansas, there's a lot of geographical names to get used. And if you have any questions about these, you want to have fun with these. These are the most commonly used um, geographical names in, 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 East, in Eastern North America for, for the plants that we have in Arkansas. So I, I went through all the names in Arkansas and tried to figure out what were the geographical names that were used. Um, so so you know, there's lots and lots of geographical names out there. Uh, another major category for, 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 for the meaning behind plant names are commemorative names. And that's pretty straightforward, right? You want to commemorate someone, whether they were whether they were your friend or or a researcher, um, the, the person who supported you. Um, but there's also a lot of kind of interesting history here. So these categories kind of blur the lines. They, 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 it's not like they're they're silos. They they all intergrade. Um, Hillia parasitica. This is a member of the coffee family, right? And it's named for this guy John Hill. And you would think that oh, it must be some sort of parasitic plant. Turns out it's not. It's a vining. It's 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 a vining a member of the coffee family. And the person, and this, and this guy Jacques, who just who described it, did not like John Hill. He thought that Hill was a parasite. He thought that Hill was Hill was renowned for basically um, finding out about the work of others. He would find out somebody was doing work, and then he would scoop them. He would step in and actually publish on on, on the work that other people were doing. And so he was kind of despised by some of his by some of his uh, his contemporaries. And so Jacques was actually just trying to insult John Hill and call John Hill a parasite with that name. Um, and there's there's other fun stories like Kamalina. Um, it's, it's kind of a, there's a historical story. This is the picture that we have here in the lower right here. There was a story of these three Dutch brothers, but sometimes you see that it was two brothers and a nephew. So again, depending on whose version of the story you listen to, you know, it, it makes you wonder how, how true it really is if we, if we can't tell for sure what was involved. But this, is, this goes back into kind of Linnaeus' time, pre linnaeus time in the 1700s, and it was a scandal. There was this wealthy family where, 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 where these two brothers were, 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 were essentially represented by the blue petals here. 
There were two brothers who were, who, who, who were good, you know, wealthy businessmen who did everything they were supposed to. But the third person, whether it was another brother or nephew, um, was like a black sheep of the family. Was, it was essentially going out and gambling and doing all kinds of, 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 of dubious, skeptical things. Um, and so this, this was kind of just a, like a, a high society gossip back in the 1700s about, about this, this Dutch family. And so when Linnaeus found this flower that had the two blue petals and one white one, he used it to commemorate this scandalous Dutch family back 300 years ago, right? Um, and the, the, the last one I mentioned here, just because just it was kind of a fun story and it's something you'll never find in the literature anywhere here, but Camadoria, this bottom name here, Camadoria rosabelli um, is a palm. It's one of these parlor palms. It's one, it's one of the palms that people use as, as house plants, right? So the, the story that was passed on to me, if, if you look at the publication, um, this is not mentioned there, um, but, but a friend of the man who described this plant told me that, that his buddy told him that Rosabel was actually his favorite prostitute in town. This, this was in Costa Rica. And, and that basically he was commemorating his, his favorite prostitute with his name, even though in writing he, 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 he told a different story. And so, so why I mention that is we often don't have a clue what the backstories are behind these names unless somebody has actually put it into writing, unless someone's actually published it or passed the stories along word of mouth. So a lot of times when we look at names, most of us are still going to be clueless about the history involved unless we've made the effort to study them in detail. Um, and and the, the last major category here is that there's one, there's one minor one after this, or that some of these names turn out to be silly or spurious names. And there's kind of a fun website there. You want to play with that. You can you know, learn some new stuff here. Um, sometimes people just made up names for fun, right? Uh, sometimes they're just anagrams. Sometimes people just want to be the first or the last in the alphabet. Sometimes they just want to make like a bad pun, like Coast, Costas. Costas is a, is a ginger relative. So if you think about Costa Rica as the country, well, this person would describe Costas Ricas, you know, which is just being silly. Um, uh, Tynanthus Croatianus. Um, that's not the way that word should be spelled. It should have been Croatii. It should, it should, not, have been, it should not have had the anus, the honest at the end of that word there. Um, the, Tom Crowett is, 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 is a very prolific researcher um, who works with the Big Noniesi family. Um, and the person who described this was commemorating Tom, but at the same time kind of making fun of him by talking about, about Tom Crowett's anus, basically. And so that, the guy that described this was telling the story and it just, it just, he did it on purpose. He deliberately used a, a grammatically incorrect ending just, just to be vulgar, just, just to be crude, right? And another fun story that you might want to read about, Asplundia Isabellina, is, this is something you can read about on Wikipedia, is, is, is a fun, <laughs> there apparently was a queen who vowed that she was not going to change her, her undergarments until the war was won. Her, her, you know, her castle was being besieged, she was at war, um, and apparently for like two years she never changed her underwear, right? And so there's this, there's this particular kind of yellowish white you know, this kind of yellowish white color, it's called Isabelline, right? It's actually, it's, it's, it's a real color, which is supposed to be commemorating this queen who supposedly never changed her underwear. It, of course, it's not true. There, 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 was, there was no historical queen who did that, but, it, but it's kind of pop culture. People, people believe, there are people who believe that it might've been based in a, in a real story. Um, it's nonetheless a color named after, the, after, after this, 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 this Queen Isabel. And so the last major category of names here then are names in which we've completely lost the meaning. So if you think about the example I provided, why was I talking about Tom Crowett? And then why was I mentioning the, the, the guy about the, with the prostitute? Well, those, those kinds of stories never make it into, into writing, right? They're going to be names that get used and, 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 and eventually people forget the stories, but people don't know what the background, what the real stories were behind the scenes. And so sometimes all of a sudden, you know, 200 years later, none of us really know what the names meant. Um, to the person who used them, right? And so, for instance, this, this author, Alblet, he actually used, coined this term Madalea, and no one to this day at this point in time has, has any good guesses. None of us know what language it came from or what he meant by that. Um, but I, I bet there was a story. I, I bet he was having fun. He was, he was doing something weird and having fun with it. And, and, and at this point in time, we've, we've lost that story. We no, longer, we no longer know what kind of game he was playing, but we're left with a name that we don't understand. And so th that was it for like the major categories. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I want to mention here is, is that you do sometimes have to be careful when you're trying to track down etymology and not be confused by false cognates. So aquafoliaceae, if you know, if, if you know, if you know, if you know the word aqua, I mean how it refers to water, right? like, like an aquifer, right? Um, it turns out in this case here, it's not referring to water, and then fol refers to leaf, right? So a lot of people will make the mistake of assuming that, and this, and this is the holly family, as you can see pictured here on the left. Um, this is not the water leaf family. That, that's the, this, 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 the, the, the agila is actually a word that refers to an eagle's claw, right? 
And so the, the, the European species, the European holly has, has leaves like, the, like what we're seeing here on the left. Um, and so someone looked at that, the same kind of mentality that looked at a, at a, at a, at a, at a, at a lycopodium, oh, that looks like a wolf's paw. Um, someone looked at this holly leaf and said that reminded them of an eagle's claw, right? So aquifolium actually refers to eagle's claw. Another example, trichosperma. If, again, if you know, if you know not a little bit about roots, you might see the tri and think, oh, it has something to do with three. No, it turns out it has to do with trick. T-R-I-C-H is, 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 a, is a root that means hair. Right? And so this, this, this genus name means like having a hairy seed. Sperm refers to seed. So, so trichosperma literally means hairy seed. Um, but, but someone who, who knows just a little bit might think it has something to do with three. So you do have, you do have to be careful sometimes in trying to sort out the, the, the etymology and make sure that, that, that you're not being fooled by false cognates. And so what, we, what we're left with though is this idea um, that we can still sometimes have these just incredibly ridiculous names, right? Most people are off put by, by short names. Quercus alba is, 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 seems to be the end of the world for some students, right? Look at something like this, this the Gameracanthus chytoderma gamerus, Loracata bicalensis. Oh my God, yeah. It's like, and so one of the things here is, 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 is to keep in mind is, is that there are roots in there, right? There, there, there are actually root words in there. And if you can break the words down into their syllables and understand the phonemes. So a phoneme, again, is kind of the unit of noise that we make. You know, every combination of sounds that your mouth makes is called a phoneme. Um, and so, so if, you, if you look at these big fancy words like that, um, I don't know what all that means, the gamera, canthus, chytoderma. But when I'm looking at that, I know that acanth means spines, that, that acanth part means spiny. And dermo is, refers to skin, dermis skin, right? So I see a can and derm, I'm thinking, okay, this thing probably has spiny skin. Don't know if it does or not. It's an invalid name that's not used. Um, but, but if you know the roots, once again, it tells you something. And a, a, a kind of a more personal story here is slightly easier to understand here is that when I was starting out as a student and, and my, my undergrad botany professor actually likes mistletoes a lot. And mistletoes are parasitic plants that live you know, on, on other plants. Um, and so, I was familiar with this with this name here, and I see this 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 fifth line down here where it says job, and in in my ignorance, I I pronounced that last name Quidget. I said, oh, it's a job Quidget. So for 20 years, I thought there was a mistletoe specialist called Job Quidget. I was at the Missouri Town Garden one year, and I was I was just happened to be in the mistletoe area, and this man introduced himself to him, to me as Job Kite, and and the first thing that, that was in my head is I wanted to ask Job Kite if he'd ever met Job Quidget, right? And so. And so there's no harm or shame or, or you know, or just in, in, in not knowing how to pronounce things, not knowing what they mean, but just be aware that even with these giant fancy names, these, these, these seemingly unpronounceable names there, somebody out there knows the right way to pronounce it, right? Somebody out there knows what it means and, 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 and how they think it should be pronounced. Um, but we don't have to always necessarily listen to those people in terms of pronunciation, right? There are basic patterns that we can all pick up on though. I'm just using this to, to, to illustrate the point here. If you learn root words, if you learn the basic root words, it's kind of like understanding that, that snuff. If you think about most of the words that we use in English that start with an, with an SN actually related to the nose. There are exceptions. And there, there are going to be some exceptions out there. But everything from the snuffleupagus to, to, to a pig snorting um, has to do with the fact that, that, that somehow in the past, um, our ancestors used snuff to refer to things associated with the nose, right? So if you can understand commonalities, it, it, it makes it much, much easier to comprehend the words that are being used. And so ultimately to wrap up this part here, um, just kind of forget Latin. Uh, we don't, you don't actually have to learn all the Latin rules. You don't have to, you don't have to get, get, get bogged down by them. If you just add these words to your vocabulary and just try to use scientific names, um, it doesn't matter that you're not gonna pronounce them the same way as everybody else. It doesn't matter that, 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 that you might not know the whole like etymological history of the word. Um, you don't have to understand the, the, the Latinized rules, the nomenclature rules. Um, all you got to do is look at it and say, that's Quercus alba. And, and, and that's just as meaningful as saying a white oak, right? Um, and so this idea of just using the scientific names, and you can just rote memorize them basically without understanding them, if, if that's your preference, right? Um, and so, and, and, I, and, I, and then why I say that? Um, because people who argue with me about how common names are better, what does a sneeze weed mean? What does a foxglove mean? What is lamb's quarters? Um, we don't know the we don't know the meaning of hardly any of the common names that we use either, right? Um, so, th so there's 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 a there's a lot more about this that could be talked about if we had like an open course discussion. Um, but what I want to do now, though, is because because we're just about out of time here, is just is just is just is just stop here. We've got you know roughly five to ten minutes left here. Um, 
what I wanted to do is just, is just point out for, for, for those of y'all that are interested in following up on this, is, is that the next module goes through a specific example of the gentian alias. Again, this is the order that contains the coffee family, the gentian family, the milkweed family, uh, the, 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 this um, 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 Spagilia marylandica, the Indian pink family. Um, and so, and, 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 and with this example, I go through and talk about phylogeny, talk about features, I talk about what the name means, and then I go through his various families and talk about the, the etymology of the different genera and stuff. Um, so if you're interested in exploring a specific case study of, 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 of applying what we've been talking about to a specific set of families, that's module one. Module two kind of looks a little bit about a kind of like nomenclature and history a little bit. There's, there's some stuff here about Linnaeus, which is kind of fun, kind of fascinating. If you've got any questions, you know, please please follow up. I just I just knew there was no way I could talk about all this stuff tonight, so I just decided to give you little modules like this to, to whet your appetite, maybe. Then there's a very very brief part about understanding phylogeny. Um, this is a a talk that, that deserves an entire semester all by itself, right? If you if you want to really truly grasp the modern phylogenetic approach and all the vocabulary, it, it takes study, right? And the, but that's part of what's behind a name. Relationships is part of what's in a name. And the final part here, again, the final module here, if you, if you want to look at it, read it, and, and ask questions about it, is, is looking more at the actual botanical nomenclature, some of the rules, some of the guidelines, and stuff about types, and, and, what, and what some of the different rules are, and, and stuff like that. So essentially, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of stuff there. There's, there's, I'm going to jump back to the, to, to the end here. Um, there's also some, some, some websites here that are kind of fun to play with. If, you, if you're interested in the etymology or interested in, in pursuing uh, some of this stuff, follow up, please. Um, I do want to stress um, that since I didn't, I didn't go into, I didn't talk about Linnaeus in detail. I didn't go into much detail on this kind of stuff here, but I do want to keep in mind that it's, it's the, 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 the names are just like we are, and they represent a kind of change over time. They represent a, a tradition of passing along information over time. And so I just wanted to kind of um, make sure that you understand that I'm passing on to you information that I was taught by my professors who got from their professors. And, and, and we are the direct academic grandchildren of Linnaeus, right? Linnaeus taught his students who, who taught their students. And so you are now part of the legacy, right? You're all now part of this legacy of learning information as, as it's been passed down for 300 years now, right? And so with, 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 with that said, we're, we're, I'm gonna go ahead and, 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 and stop here just by, just by kind of reiterating that, that if, you wanna, if you wanna know about plant names, you know, understanding the words that we use, understanding the etymology of the words, um, you can study about the history, the relationships. Um, you can understand the follow, study the nomenclature. Um, you can also just use the names from, to, to put names on plants, which is what I personally like to do. And if you have any questions, I, I certainly welcome them. And I guess at, at this point, oops, at this point though, I'm going to go ahead and stop because um, we're, we're, we're at the end. If there are any questions, I'd love to address them. Yeah, thank you, Richard. That was wonderful. It looks like we have a lot of positive feedback in the uh, the chat here. Just want to read it to you. Uh, Karen Sill and myself found your joke about uh, Job uh, Quijet uh, pretty <laughs> funny. Uh, we both laughed out loud <laughs> at that. Um, and Rob King says, very informative and most entertaining. Uh, Karen Sill also want to let you know, too. Uh, well, she says here in the chat uh, that she moves at ANPS. Just keep asking Richard back over and over and over again until he has a chance to present all his modules. Just keep it coming. This is so much fun and interesting. And I'll uh, let you know that Richard and I have already talked about all that. I think we're hoping to have him back each uh, year uh, to present on all kinds of different things. I think next year we might look at uh, more of the phylogeny uh, side of things. Uh, if that's if Richard's uh, still interested and available and uh, being a part of our our programming next year but um yeah because I've, I've really enjoyed these as well and i think everyone else has too um does anybody have any questions for richard uh, i'm going to take a minute to kind of put those links back in the chat so that way you can uh have richard's email if you want to follow up with him for his slides uh, i know he'd be willing to share those um I also have the links to the native plant society website and our youtube channel where you'll be able to watch the recording of this uh, video later. Uh, Eric, Karen. I have, I, yeah, I have a question. I, I know you referred us to the, is it Curious Taxonomy? Yep. Doc? Mm, I didn't notice which web, tech, Curious Taxonomy, but are there any other general places, book? I mean, I know we can go to the web and just sort of do a wild search, but I just find the the, the study of these words absolutely fascinating to me it's more fun than the plants <laughs> but i kind of don't even know where to begin can you narrow down our search any more than that curious taxonomy uh website 
Oh, absolutely. There's, there's, there's probably at least 20 or 30 books sitting on my shelf here that are about the, the, the etymology of, of plant names, right? Um, and so, so ultimately, yes, if, if you want to send an email, I can, I, can send you, I can send you a list of some of the books that I'm familiar with. Um, okay. And, okay. and if your goal is to learn the botanical Latin, then, then, then this, 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 this book that you can see here, this botanical Latin by Stern, um, this, this is the gold standard. This, this is the book that has been the classic standard for you know, 50, 60 years now. Um, and, and, and it's been updated and modernized. And, and so this, this is the go-to. If, if, if you're a hardcore, want to learn about Latin as it's applied to botany, this is, this is, the, this is the book that, that, that you want to pick up. But yeah, send me an email and I can send you a list of the 20 or 30 books that I would recommend. Okay, this is very helpful. Thank you. This is exactly what I needed. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Karen. Are there any other questions for Dr. Abbott? See, we have uh, in the chat, Donna Gwaltney says, thank you. Uh, David Darby says, thanks for your presentation. I think it serves to put us in a positive attitude for learning much more. So, I would agree. There's always so much to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel like we really just scratched the surface with uh, my only giving you an hour, you know. Uh, so I have to keep having you back. Well, um, again, thank you. We really appreciate you giving your time to teach us all. Um, I know we all have enjoyed this. I want to thank everyone again for being with us here today. Again, the recording is going to be uh, placed on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe. And um, that way, anytime we upload a video, it should like send you an email notifying you. Uh, or you can just check back periodically to see uh, what videos we have added to our Arkansas Native Plant Society YouTube channel. Our next webinar in the series is going to be Saturday, July 16th at 6 p.m. Uh, that will be on plant communities of the Lower Mississippi River Islands with Grace McCartha. She is a student, a graduate student at uh, Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, who is doing her research on those plant communities there on the Lower Mississippi River Islands. And uh, again, uh, I placed the links in the chat, but ANPS.org to learn more about the Native Plant Society, and you can join uh, today right now if you wanted to with uh, PayPal so and with that unless there are any questions uh, we will conclude this webinar thank you again Dr. Abbott we've uh, really appreciated you sharing your knowledge with us once again so this has been fun. Great. I enjoy it yeah and just as a final part I think just um, the PDF of, of this of these slides is already available so if, if you want that just 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 contact me or Eric or Karen I think all three of us should have should have the PDF of, of this evening's talk so Yep. Yeah. Uh, happy to share those. So uh, I think a few people have contacted me for the second one, haven't responded to that yet. I have trouble accessing my Google Gmail uh, from the computer that I use the most because uh, my work computer is the one I use the most. So they block that. Can't use. Uh, so uh, I'd recommend if, uh, if you, ha you haven't heard back from me to reach out to Dr. Abbott. So, thank all you right. all. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. bye.